Rose friends, I had the privilege of hearing Tom Carruth at a recent ARS National Convention in San Diego. If you have heard him speak, you know he's filled to the brim with Rose information, wit, and charm. On this day, he regaled us with the tale of Rosa Sumuriana. You are in for a treat, so grab your mug of something yummy. It's time for Rose Chat. It's time for the Rose Chat Podcast, a podcast dedicated to celebrating the world's most beloved flower, the rose. Join award-winning gardeners Chris Van Cleef and Teresa Byington as they chat with rose lovers and experts from around the globe. With each episode, you'll gain valuable knowledge and insights to achieve the rose garden you've always dreamed of. Listen now as we explore the world of roses. Try Haven Brand Soil Conditioners, providing generations of gardeners with a truly all-natural alternative to chemical fertilizers with their line of composted manure and alfalfa teas. Easy to brew and use on all indoor and outdoor plants. Find them online at manuretea.com. So the theme of our conference today, an underlying theme is the preservation of varieties. So I'm going to tell you, spin a little yarn, a tale about the unplanned preservation of a variety and how it actually changed the rose world. We have over 1,250 varieties at the Huntington in our collection. And they range anywhere from 1513 to 2020 in their dates. But these are a few that we have rescued there. But I'm going to talk to you first about a little time travel. Let's go back in this tale to 1953. <laughs> so we're going to have a little bit about American rose industry history, a little bit about rose history. I thought you'd like to see the new Chevrolet for 1953. <laughs> Elizabeth just coming into power. First cover of Playboy. Little did she know that she'd have a rose named after her later on. And oddly enough, Russia was in the news, as it still is today. The 1953 All-America winners were Ma Perkins. Not, not easily found these days, but Chrysler Imperial certainly is. <laughs> And Chrysler Imperial was, caused a great brouhaha because it was one of the first promotional roses that were ever named. And after it was named, the ARS demanded that the names be reviewed by the committee from that point forward. But we're going to talk about this guy. I wish I had an earlier picture of him from that time. This is the magnificent Herb Swim, one of the great American rose breeders. And he was working for Armstrong at that point. He had two different stints for Armstrong. This was in his first stint, and he was toward the end of a 13-year time as the breeder for Armstrong, where he had taken over for doc from Dr. Walter Lamers. And in 1953, he wasn't thinking about Chrysler Imperial or any of those. He thought about something called a shrub rose, which was a very novel idea at that point. And the species that caught his eye in that work was Rosa Suliana. Now, I never talked to him as to why that really that species caught his eye. Maybe it was the cinnamon fragrance. Maybe it was the large pyramid-shaped clusters. Maybe it was the beautiful pigmentation of the foliage because it has these almost red margins on the leaves. No doubt he had disease resistance in mind, but I can tell you one thing he did not like, once bloomers and single petaled. He was very trained against single petal roses. But these were the characteristics that he had to mount when he started breeding with Rosa Suliana. And he did some initial uh, crosses. Oh, I forgot the large rampant habit because this thing will eat small children and dogs that might walk by. <laughs> so we had to work against that as well. But he only had those thoughts. He made a few crosses, and two years later, he left Armstrong. And he formed a partnership with Ole Weeks of Weeks Roses. And they began the great partnership that launched Weeks into their hybridizing. Up to that point, Weeks did not have their own hybridizing effort. And Ole wanted to establish that. So by bringing Herb on, then they could do this. And the idea of shrubs went out of his head at that point because Weeks needed hybrid teas, floribundas, that was the market. And the very first year he was there, he bred this rose, which you might know yeah. as Mr. Lincoln. 
And he went on to create some great roses at that point, Angel Face being one of them. I mean, there were many, many great roses under Swimming Weeks. And that partnership lasted for about 12 years. If any of you ever knew Mr. Weeks, he was a world-class curmudgeon. <laughs> and it was pretty difficult to work for him for a long period. When they parted ways, they never spoke again, oh. interestingly enough. But they left a legacy that was pretty amazing. Once that happened, Audrey Armstrong, who was the second generation of Armstrong Nurseries, called Herb and said, can we tempt you to come back? Because his son had actually been doing the breeding work during that time. So that was through 1967. He came back to Armstrong in 1968, and the very first year there, he bred this rose, which you might recognize <laughs> as Double Delight. You can see what I mean about Herb's amazing career. But when he got back to Armstrong, he could open up his imagination again. And he hired this young guy to help him out. This is Jack Christensen. And he started making some crosses again with Suliano. Now we're up to 1970. There's the new Chevy for the year. There's the headlines. Playboy covers improved just a little bit. <laughs> and now we're not frightened of Russia, we're frightened of Frankenstein. But Herb was back to thinking about Suliana. The only All-America winner that year was first prize, still on the market. So Herb began to make a few crosses. And one of the crosses he made was with Europeana. And it set a few seed. It wasn't the most cooperative or easy cross. But that became the first generation. And here it is written out, Rosa Suliana times Europeana. And that was the seedling number. Now, I have no picture of this, but don't cry on me. Because I can tell you, it was a pink blend single, so you knew it was a cross. Because Suliana was white and the mother was red. It still had the large pyramid clusters. It still had the clean foliage with the beautiful pigmentation, but it was still once blooming, and it was still big. So we had to move on another generation. So in 74, at that point, Herb's health was taking, forcing him into retirement, and he made the last few crosses, one with, with Zarina with this seedling. Now this seedling, nowadays we probably know was triploid. It was very difficult to get any seed or any pollen out of it, but they did get one successful cross with Zarina as the mother, and this gave us a pink blend semi-double, so we got a few more petals. We still had the large clusters. We still had the clean foliage. It began to rebloom just a little bit, just a smattering of rebloom, and it was slightly more contained habit. So see, each generation as we move on, we're gaining some ground in petalage, we're gaining some ground in controlling the habit, we're gaining some ground in getting the reblooming characteristic into it. Jack was in the, in, in the head of the department at this point, and that was 1979. And he took this seedling, which turned out to be extremely fertile, so you're three generations away and your fertility is restored, and he crossed it with several different varieties, Royal Gold, Trumpeter, Sun Sprite, some other unnamed seedlings, to name a few. And at that time, he hired this guy <laughs> as his assistant. And I was breeding for cut flowers, roses at that point, so greenhouse varieties was our, our real source and concentration from my end of it, but I was still fascinated by, by what I was seeding in the garden roses. And at this point, images are going to fail us, so I have to be old-fashioned and go back to text. If you'll give me just a moment. So it was 1979. Herb Swim, or 1970, wait a minute, wrong text, oh no. Hang on, we're having technical difficulties. <laughs> this old-fashioned stuff just throws me. Okay. So Jack had enticed me in 1979 from Jackson and Perkins. 
And Herb was still with us. Herb would come visit very often, and that was really great. So we should go back one. I want it plain. Just that ping. Right there. Thanks. <clears throat> Jack had already de designated his crosses on that seedling, and it turned out to be a really fertile parent. Two years later, when survivors of these 1979 crosses came to flower in the field, it was a sight to behold. The great-great-grandmother's huge clusters of low petal flowers had come through in almost all of the babies. The unusually pigmented foliage had hung on strong as well, showing a deep red piquety on the young green leaves. Most of them had climber-like habits, but a few were more bushy to compact in style. Later on, the majority proved to have some repeat bloom. There were a lot of different colors, a few darker reds, some corals, mostly blended pinks, whites, and two rare yellow varieties, which came out of Sun Sprite. I had never seen anything like this group. I was so excited, I was a young breeder. To me, this, this amplified what a shrub rose should be. It should be full of flowers, with a relaxed habit, and beautiful clean stock. So I really thought, you know, this was it. This was it. I was young and idealistic. I didn't have my commercial eye. I was so gobsmacked by this family and was just certain something had to emerge. I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. uh, nothing emerged. And nothing actually emerged from that whole 1979 year of breeding, which, was, which happens. It's Murphy's Law of Breeding. Now, by the fall of 1982, these had all been butted out into the field and increased slightly. And they had come into flower, and they were a stunning scene. At that time, there was a great rose club in Southern California called the San Gabriel Rose and Horticultural Society. And they were sponsoring a talk by the then new curator of the Huntington Library Rose Garden, Claire Martin, who was going to talk about shrubs. Now, his idea of shrubs were Austin's. But I thought this would be a perfect thing to show people about the concept of shrub. So I cut a bouquet of all the different colors and, and waddled it over there to set it up so everybody could see. It was a colorful mass of huge hydrangea head-like clusters. It exemplified what a shrub should be. Now among that membership was a great little Polish Catholic spitball of a person called Julia Sudol. And she was a phenomenal rosarian and plants person and a great character. She was very devout to her church, her Catholic church, and she would make these potpourris, and she would dry whole buds and spiral them off the edge of the container. I don't know how she did it. But when the talk was finished, I guarded over the plants so that none of them accidentally left, and Julia waited until the crowd had died down, and she came in, she was quite short, she stood on my feet <laughs> and said, what are you going to do with that yellow one? And I told her I had to take it back. Well, you learned pretty early on that you didn't win arguments with Julia. So I gave her the yellow one on the promise that she would never distribute it to anyone else from that point. Shortly thereafter, Armstrong Nursery dissolved. So Moet Hennessy bought it. They did some very stupid, unnecessary moves. It went into bankruptcy and eventually sold to Jackson and Perkins. When I saw it was on the decline, I left and I had my 11th month vacation <laughs> before I started work with Weeks Roses in the hybridizing. Now, just as we were beginning, we couldn't really start crossing because Weeks had to move off the property that we were on, so there was no need to build a greenhouse. And I began doing the talking circuit and the sales circuit, and I ran into Julia one day. In her, her usual sailor sort of language, she said, that blankety-blank yellow thing's about to eat me out of the house and home. <laughs> and it took me a little while to think, what blankety-blank yellow thing is she talking about? And then I realized she had that seedling because all those seedlings were lost. Ooh. All those seedlings were lost. So I took propagating material immediately, and I shared it with Jack Christensen, and we began breeding. And that's where we move forward. So this is the bloodline of that yellow seedling that you see here. And rather than repeating this every time, from this point forward, we're just going to call it squiggle. <laughs> so as a parent, squiggle was pretty prolific. 
And one of the first introductions that came from it was Flutterby, which is Playboy times Squiggle. Again, as a direct parent, Long Tall Sally, which was all that jazz and squiggle, and Bebop, which was Santa Claus and squiggle. Now, Bebop is the only one that has a compact habit out of these, this first generation group. The rest are all tall, clambering sort of things. Sky's the Limit was a direct first generation, and that's Princess Mariana crossed with Swiggle. This is the only one that had double pedalage out of the bunch. So in that first generation, we're getting a few more with double pedalage. We're getting a few more with compact habit, but mostly the Suleana bloodline is still dominating. And all of the right? Holding pretty good. Holding pretty good. Now, as a grandparent, this was all ablaze, and it was donned on by Squiggle by Dortmund, so a lot of climber bloodlines in it, so you'd expect it to be a climber. And Spice So Nice was Westerland times Flutterby, so again, climber bloodlines, you got climbers out of it. There were a few minor climbers that emerged from that as well that were minor introductions. However, I was just able about three years ago to find a source for Jacob's Ladder for the collection at the Huntington. All of these are big, clamoring plants. But you can see pedalage is more double. And rebloom is better. Now, there were two grandchildren that had a more compact habit, one being out of the blue, <coughs> which is Stephen's Big Purple, crossed with International Herald Tribune and Swiggle. Now, you're going to see that International Herald Tribune and Squiggle repeating itself again. So we'll just call it IHT for this point. <laughs> and IHT is what brought us Rosa Californica into the bloodline. Miami Moon, relatively forgettable, but compact. And this was Voodoo times Squiggle with Impatient. Now at that point, the disease resistance was out the window on that one. And that's one of its downfalls, but Out of the Blue is still in commerce. Now, as a great-grandparent, well, I wish it was that color. Yay. This is Night Owl. So there's that International Herald Tribune and Squiggle again with Sweet Chariot, Blue Nile, and Rosy Outlook. Rosy Outlook is a half-sister of Fourth of July. Turn them into roses and stars and stripes. You guys know this one as show people. This is Paul Ecke, Jr., which is one of the singles out of this group. And again, International Herald Tribune is behind it, along with Squiggle. And then one of my All-America winners, Wild Blue Yonder. So you see now, in most cases, the pedalage is definitely increased. We do have steady repeat bloom. We do have better habit. We're mostly keeping good disease resistance, mostly keeping the pigmentation of the foliage. But the most exciting group out of it, the breakthrough group, was my purple bloodlines. So Ebb Tide, Midnight Blue, and Route 66 all came from one cross, and this is the cross. So it's kind of everything purple in the kitchen sink. <laughs> yeah. And Sam McGrady always taught me Breed from broad bloodlines. The broader your bloodlines, the better your chance of novelty. Well, this was very novel, and it's quite unusual to get three introductions from one cross. I mean, it's unusual to get two. It's rare to get three. <coughs> but this was a fantastic group, and it kept the fragrance of Rosa Californica. Now, the favorite grandchild of all is this yellow one, Julia Child. And because of Julia Child, this bloodline is going to carry worldwide now. Because Julia is such a good parent and such a good rose, and it performs the same way everywhere it goes, whether it's in Japan or Germany or Australia or New Zealand, it looks the same. And that is extremely rare. There are probably less than 10 roses that do that. So she makes a great parent, and that was her bloodline. She should have been a climber. <laughs> Almost all of her sisters were climbers. Nobody told her. <laughs> and yes, Julia did pick this rose out for her honor. She was aware of it, although she never saw it come to commerce. 
Now let's go to the great grandkids and beyond. Cinco de Mayo, Topsy Turvy and Julia Child. And by the way, Ping, if you're still in the audience, I might mention that it seems to be chili thrip resistant. Next up in the t purples, Twilight Zone with Ebb Tide and Della Reese. And then, of course, Happy Go Lucky with Julia Child. Still more great grandkids. These are not so well known. This was an independent introduction of Heather Lincoln. Uh, this was a one time promotional rose called Uptown Girl with About Face. And this is one of the Oh, my least favorite named collections of all roses. Uh, the Downton Abbey roses. Uh, this is Edith's darling. I'm glad Edith liked it, but uh, no. Now, Christian has his day for a family that gave him three introductions. Doris Day and Jump for Joy are sister seedlings, as is Sparkle and Shine. I think Sparkle and Shine is Christian's finest rose to date, and he will have better, but these, this is the darn good rose. And there's the parents, Julie Newmar and Julia Child. Now, Julie Newmar is out of St. Patrick and Living Easy. And it gave three great roses. It had many promising sisters in that group. Very good. Now, further, onward, Wild Blue Yonder and Meredith gave great dumb a grand dame, and diamond eyes also should have been a climber. <laughs> but nobody told it. Yeah. And this, this was the only one that kept the miniature habit from baby love, and see how far behind baby love is in that bloodline? Wow. Yeah. It came through in this seedling. And the rest of its sisters were all clamoring miniature climbers, assorted different types of shrubs. And here's a brand new one for 2019. It's a cross of Julia Child and Stormy Weather. It should have been a climber. It's not. It's a Floribunda, and its name is Huntington's Hundred. And it will honor Huntington's Centennial next year. Now, it's also sold under the new pseudonym of Life of the Party, but Huntington's Hundred is its registered name. And it is a heck of a bloomer. It's really floriferous and wonderfully fragrant. So let's go back to that. It opens the yellow color and then blushes to the pink. It has a 35 day bloom cycle on it. It holds a round habit and you don't need to put your nose to it, you just need to walk by it. It smells of lemon blossoms and baby powder. Not cheap baby powder either. <laughs> Moving on to more great greats, easy to please. There for, so Wild Blue Yonder brings that bloodline in. Another one of those favorite roses, Violet's Pride. And look at that International Herald Tribune and Squiggle in there again, coming through. And then one more of those, Pretty Lady Rose, not to be confused with Pretty Lady but people do it all the time, <clears throat> Grand Dame and Doris Day. And then brand new on the market, Celestial Night oh, is out of Ebb Tide and Grand Dame. So then you've got this on both sides ah. of that offspring. And then all dressed up is Grand Dame, Sunset Celebration, and Julia Child. Uh, Celestial Night have fragrance? Yes, yes. So that's kind of the end of my little tale. It will go on and on as Ping is revealing some Julia Child seedlings and other breeders are revealing some other seedlings from the purples and from the yellows. That little unnamed seedling that Julie Sudal kept for me is behind every one of these. And I think that's kind of a cool story. Yes. Yeah. Now, how many of you have never been to the Huntington? Okay, now you have to stand up so I can publicly shame you. Uh, you have to come visit us. And it's not just the Rose Garden we're talking about. We're talking about 170 acres of garden with a Chinese garden, a Japanese garden, a jungle garden, a desert garden. 
it goes on and on. My little domain is the three acre, but this is our Japanese garden, which is over 100 years old. Mr. Huntington bought the property in 1903, and he was wooing his yet-to-be wife in 1912. She hated California. It was the boondocks. She was a New England socialite in her own mind, at least. And when she went on her European shopping spree of four months in the summer of 2012, he built the Japanese garden. 1912, uh, sorry. And it must have worked because they married in 1913. Okay. So the rose garden is our domain. And we have over 1,250 varieties. And when I arrived there six and a half years ago, the garden had been without direction for almost two years. And the plants were not in great shape. We had many plants which were unnamed. We had many plants that were just barely hanging on to life, and there was no way to replace them. So the first thing to do was kind of get the inventory in order. We're down to just two unknowns right now out of the group, thanks to help from Bob and some of our other ID committee members that work with me and Greg. I worked with Weeks Roses on a contract propagation. So we sent them the propagating wood of these very weak varieties like Lilac Dawn, and they grafted five new plants of each of those. So in two years later, we got back these nice, stout, hefty new plants. We put one in the ground. We sold off the other four, and our plant sales are in the auction, like you're committing to today. And some of those varieties were quite unusual, like La Jolla from 1953, and the beautiful Eleanor Wilmot from 1935. So here's our beautiful stocky plants. And over this almost seven year period now, we have rescued about 315 varieties. And I can tell you, nothing is more pleasing than walking out in the garden right now and seeing a big three by five foot plant of the doctor and knowing that it was from a plant that was just barely hanging on to life when I got there. So we've added at least 225 varieties to the collection. So just to repeat our numbers again, over 1,250 varieties in the collection and over 2,500 plants total. So some of those that we've rescued, like Fabergé from 1969, Grey Dawn from 1975, and the beautiful little Emily Louise from 1990. Now in springtime of 2017, all the flower gods and weather gods lined up, and we had one of the most beautiful displays I had seen in many, many years. So I'm just gonna close with showing you some of these shots of the Huntington from that day, from that time. We've now completely replaced all the trellising that you see. It's over 700 feet of trellising. And it's done with a combination of extruded aluminum and wood. That's in the Shakespeare Garden. So that's Love Song on a Tree with a pyracantha that's been tortured to look like a Christmas tree. <laughs> this, is, this is pyracantha tortuosa. <laughs> There's our sparkle and shine bed, which welcomes you into the rose garden. It doesn't, it's not subtle. It doesn't say welcome to the rose garden. It's like, welcome to the rose garden. <laughs> and it's blooming all the time. There you can see some of our trellis work. That was a two year project. We had to unwind all the plants, suspend them in the garden, get the trellis built and put them back on. Oh, wow. And they surprisingly took well to it. So the building that you see there is our tea room. And actually, this is my, Mr. Huntington's man cave. She wouldn't let him smoke in the house, so she threw him out. And he had like a one-lane bowling and a pool table and probably a beer refrigerator in there. But now it's our tea room, which is kind of the irony of it all. The building in the distance was their main house. Poor little things. <laughs> and it is now the, uh, the gallery for the European art collection. So both Pinky and Blue Boy hang in this gallery. Blue Boy is being restored right now with great fanfare. We added arbors. These old arbors were made out of pipe, 
parts that are no longer available, so we had to make a mold of the old ones to match the new ones. And then we uh, planted all the climbers in pairs as you go down it. Now in the distance you can see these tree-looking sculptures. Those are the Faubois arbors that Mr. Huntington had built after he visited a Faubois exhibit in Paris in 1911. And we've recently had them restored by an artist who painstakingly over an eight and a half year process restored 100 of these trunks. And in the meantime, he built these brand new tree stump planters for us to accent the rose garden. And they're filling out beautifully. So that's Flower Girl doing her thing on top with burgundy iceberg around. And I love the bracket fungus that he worked into that stump. It's really cool. So there's a good look at the tea room. And that's two plants of mellow yellow in the front. And those of you who are on the Twitter sphere and are not constantly talking to our president, you can follow me at Tom Carruth Roses. And uh, I'm also on Instagram at Tom Carruth Roses. I don't know if you're familiar with easy. Oh, wait. No, go back. I don't know if you're familiar with Easy on the Eyes. This was a, a new introduction for 2018, and it is of the Healthemia breeding. Uh, extremely clean, large clusters, medium small flowers, but they open up pink with a raspberry eye and then fade to lavender with a purple eye and finish white with a purple eye. And that's a cross of sweet chariot time um, eyes for you. And it keeps that wonderful spicy fragrance too. These other two guys, I know you know. Thank you guys for coming out today. It's great to see all of you again. You've been listening to the Rose Chat Podcast with Chris Van Cleve and Teresa Byington, expert rose gardeners who want to help you achieve the rose garden of your dreams. Don't miss an episode. Listen anytime on our website at rosechatpodcast.com or listen on the go via the Rose Chat app on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Share this podcast with your social networks and join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by using the hashtag Rose Chat. Join us next time for another edition of the Rose Chat Podcast. The Rose Chat Podcast is a production of the Rose Chat Media Group, Birmingham, Alabama.